you know, here you got Lee, mm-hmm. uh, who's had this major, major victory. I mean, he's outnumbered, um, and he's doing, some would say, some rash things. I mean, who's going to divide his, and he would constantly divide his army up. <laughs> um, and he is going to do something that is very, very unusual. Usually after every battle, you have a rest period, whether it is, now Gettysburg was a little different, but even then you didn't have major fighting right after. Chancellorsville, you had that month off before mm-hmm. Lee's going to do anything. Fredericksburg, et cetera. There may be some um, rear guard actions, but not a whole lot. Right. But Lee is going to take the bull by the horns right after the Battle of Chantilly, which is the last battle in the in the um, second bull run campaign on um, September 1st. And it's it's amazing. He's got an army that has just won a major victory, but it's been, been beaten up pretty good. Second Manassas is brutal. Yeah. It's brutal. He's going to start marching his men up to Leesburg, getting there, beginning to get there on, the, on September the 3rd, and some of his men are crossing the Potomac River on the 4th That's into Maryland. That's crazy. That's cr- you know how tired they were, hungry, and beat <clears> up? <throat> that would have been, you know, in the infantry, even nowadays, you, you, you take the good old M2 boot everywhere you want to go. Uh, I mean, unless you're in a in a light armor reconnaissance unit or something, if you're in mm-hmm. if you're in a regular infantry unit, you're you're humping it out, and uh, you're so tired after a, a gunfight. You know, I mean, and, and this is an Afghanistan gunfight. This isn't like you know. So we're talking, you know, a few hours maybe, not right. not an all day, not all night spell. kind of thing. Two right. days in a row right, where right. thousands of people are getting you know, yes. becoming casualties. Right. And uh, you're exhausted, you know, you're exhausted. Yeah, so right. just even patrolling a few kilometers can be mm-hmm. exhausting the next day. Yes. But to just pick everything up and go on a, on a forced march, you know, mm-hmm. miles and miles and miles north, it'd be miserable. It'd be right, miserable. To say the least. Yes. Especially in those shoes. They got. Oh, yes. Yikes. And, and you know, you, you think about the lack of supplies that the Confederates had, and I think that was part of it. You know, Lee, just like during the Gettysburg campaign, He's desperate for supplies, and one of the major drivers for him to invade. And here you have a man who is, um, he's got an army that he knows is in bad shape. He knows they're exhausted. They have non-existent uniforms. They're in, you know, they're in rags, essentially. Many of them are barefoot. In fact, he passes an order that any soldier that does not have shoes, proper shoes, is going to be left behind at Leesburg. So he's going to lose thousands of men left behind um and then to top everything off he gets he goes out and hurts himself you know um when uh he, it's raining he's wearing this long poncho and uh somebody yells out here come the yankees and and traveler starts the bolt and he grabs the you know he's trying to restrain traveler and he falls over his uh poncho and tries to you know tries to break his fall so he breaks the bones in one hand and badly sprain, sprains his wrist on the other. And he's starting the campaign in a lot of pain. And um, it, it's just amazing that he was able to operate as he did. Well, you know, I, I want, I'm, I'm beyond my interest in U.S. military history. My other interest is boxing. I love boxing. Oh. I love, love modern boxing. I love the history of boxing. It's, mm-hmm. it's fascinating to me. And, and obviously, Teddy Atlas, uh, Mike Tyson's first uh, trainer under um, the mm-hmm. Cus Tomato is his mentor. Uh, right. He's 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 big. He's an he was an announcer or a, 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 an announcer on ESPN for years, and uh, he he talks about this thing where um, you know it's it's best like you need to do things the right way. You need to do them with good technique. You need to do them this that way. Yes. He said, except when it comes to the greats, the greats can break all the rules and it works for them because they're the greats, right? Mm-hmm. But if anybody else tries to do it, like Lee when he splits his force con- constantly, you know, yes. if anybody else attempts that, <clears throat> it comes back to bite him in the butt. It does, always. But someone like Lee can pull it off. Someone right, like Jackson right. can pull it off too, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's, it's weird. Some rules don't apply. You know, like Muhammad Ali keeps his hands down and, and, and doesn't protect his mm-hmm. face, but it works yes. for Muhammad Ali because right. he's the greatest, you know? It's, it's funny, but it, there's a lot of similarities between that concept and uh, and it's it's interesting, you know, being being injured and and his army's yes. in shambles. You would think, you know, a, a a wise commander would. All right, let's recuperate some. Let's mm-hmm. gather supplies. Let's prepare a little bit. Right. Lee just gets on the road and goes. Right. 
And, you know, you think about what, what you basically said, I think is so true as well. Lee was always on. You know, he was always successful. Um, now, the outcome may not have been what he expected, but he's always going to be uh, providing a good fight. Mm -hmm. You have someone like Jackson who has good days and bad days. Yeah. I mean, the Shenandoah Valley campaign, holy cow. Amazing. Yes. But then seven days. He, he Where is he? Yeah. And then Fredericksburg, he makes a, makes a major blunder and almost gets the Army defeated when he leaves that gap in the line mm -hmm. that he should have uh, covered. And even Antietam, uh, he left a gap in the, in the line that the, Confed that the Union troops are going to exploit. And essentially both sides on both, I know we're going to get into Antietam, but the two sides of, of um, the Confederates on both sides of Hagerstown Pike are essentially fighting independently because of that gap, at least initially. Longstreet had good days, bad days, but Lee always seemed to be consistent. You're always going to get a good fight out of him. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, they say that, I, um, I think it's Shelby Foote in the Civil War, the Ken Burns Civil War documentary talks right. about Lee's uh, uh, temper. You know, he had a temper that he worked to control his whole life. Yes. And, uh, and I, think you, I think you see his temper in the way that he pursues combat. But it's interesting because... You don't see his temper very often, mm -mm. Uh, and as you said, yes, he controlled it, but maybe if he hadn't, maybe he would have been more effective. You never know. You know, a uh, wild temper, though, can sometimes come back to oh, bite no you question. in those situations. So it's hard to say. You know, it's hard to yes. say. Um, but I think, you know, the way he approaches battle, he, I think, you know, I think— uh, Longstreet and Jackson are a good example of the dual sides of his his mm -hmm. his combat thinking. Right, and um, and and I think he leans more towards J the Jackson side of things with he the aggressiveness. Yeah. Yes, and I think that's why they got along so well. I think that's why Chancellorsville happens the way it does, and why it's their you know their master stroke. Right, um, is because they were very in line with the way they thought. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, in in that aspect. Now. And, Obviously, he loved Longstreet. It was his war horse, and he he has yes. moments where he takes you know, he defers to Longstreet's sure. side of the road. But uh, but he you know he more times than not he's that he's that aggressive side, and I think that's an example of his temper almost. Yeah, and I think you know when you think about the battles that he was on the defensive, he excelled. Mm -hmm. Antietam, Little Army, uh, and and most of it was a chunk of it wasn't even there on the battlefield at the beginning of the battle. Yeah. Three of his divisions were still away. Fredericksburg, except for that hiccup uh, at Prospect Hill. You know, when you think about uh, Spotsylvania, uh, how he held out, uh, outnumbered um, Petersburg. I mean, who could have stopped Grant for that many months? And yet, I, and, and one of the things that I, I really do appreciate about Lee, and I tell my, when, when we go off on tours, and they'll say, well, Lee was very rash. You shouldn't have done Pickett's Charge. You shouldn't have done this. And I say, well, one thing that you need to keep in mind is that Lee could count. And he understood that the longer the war went on. The worse it was going to get. Yes, there was, there was less chance that the South was going to be successful. And so he has, he's going to have calculated risks. And, yeah, he's going to and, – and the only way he felt that he's going to win is the aggressive punch. Just by stopping the enemy and defeating them is not – he has to he has to destroy them. And the only way he's going to destroy them is on the offensive. Right. And a lot of people, I don't think they really realize that. I don't, I don't think they do either. You know, to take it back to boxing one more time, I don't mm -hmm. want to wear yeah, this I, out. I, but uh, I, I, I look at Lee, you know, comparing the two great generals, right, Lee and Grant, and you compare them uh, against each other. Lee is Mike Tyson. Grant is Rocky Marciano, Right. He's he's he will grind he will grind you down yes. through the entire fight and when you get to the end he will not hesitate to put you down yes right uh, Lee wants to knock you out in the first round no question that about that's it. his goal that's what he, he's head hunting the whole time right and um uh, and I think you know that's kind of how I separate the two in my mind mm -hmm. and uh, and for the longest time I mean up until it doesn't at Petersburg it works for Lee. You it know, does. because just like it worked for Tyson, right? You know, right. it's the same thing. And then, you know, Jackson talks about uh, the the whole about mystify uh, your your enemy and stuff. You know, use your use your uh, reputation to your advantage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Every time Lee's winning the way he does, his that reputation is just going up oh, and no up question. and up in the in the minds of the soldiers on the Union side of the line. Yes. Um, so when you're a, when you're you know across the battlefield from them. 
you're not going to be able to help but have a little bit of a uh, base level of fear right. because of the things he's already done. True. Um, so, you know, uh, a lot of a lot here at here at Gettysburg, a lot of people will judge, you know, the pickets charge. Why didn't he do this? Why didn't he go around yes. all the, you know, but uh, <clears throat> Lee Lee understood, he, you know, at this point, he understood he was in Pennsylvania, a long ways from home. Yes. Supply chain is just completely non-existent at that mm-hmm. point. And uh, his guys were already low on supplies. They're greatly outnumbered. Yes. And uh, if he, you know, if if he tries to if he tries to do something different, if he tries to deviate and go around, like they say in the movie, go around the army right. uh, uh, of the Potomac, he might get cut off in the north and have to surrender the army. If he tries to retreat and not give battle, they're going to pursue him the whole way back to the south. And and you know the thing about warfare in that era is defeat is defeat is in the retreat, right? Like that's where the real destruction happens is when a routed army is making a maneuver they just they get leveled and that's why meade was so cautious you know lincoln after gettysburg you know you've got to be aggressive you got to go out and you have to destroy them and you're right meade understood that he could be very vulnerable and could fritter away his advantage after gettysburg right but um i forgot my train of thought we were talking about um before uh, after Lee breaking his hands and, and oh, oh, yeah, m- moving yeah. out. So um anyway, so he's he's gonna be very aggressive. He's gonna move north. And I always tell people there's um oh, I know what I was gonna mention. Why and again we're talking about Maryland campaign. We're not talking about Gettysburg. But you know, I, I oftentimes will put myself in the shoes of a uh, a general or a colonel or a or a private. And not to second guess, but to try to understand. Right. And here's Lee at Gettysburg early in the morning of the second. He wants an early attack. And he's talking to Yule. He's talking to Early. And there's no, 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 we can't do that. And then so he then switches to Longstreet. And, oh, well, wait a minute now. Um, Law's brigade isn't up yet. we got to wait here. And. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I want to march my men over so they can't be seen. That's going to take some time. Oh, they were seen. We got to go back. I think what happened is he got so frustrated when Longstreet said, well, let's, uh, there are Yankees there. He finally said, I don't give a damn. Excuse me. No, you're fine. You're fine. Um, <laughs> I've waited too long. We're not, you know, and we all get to that point. Where right. We've lost t- all of our patients, we're done. Yeah. We're not, and I, 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 so I think that was part of it. And, you know, when you have Killer Angels and when you have the movie Gettysburg, it, it's boiled down to a very simplistic Longstreet is right and Lee was wrong. Right. And not getting into these nuances. The other piece is logistics. You know, most people don't realize how important those wagon trains are and how you have thousands of wagons. And so, oh, well, Longstreet's saying, well, we ought, we shouldn't fight here. We should just move somewhere else. Great. But what about those thousands of wagons that are going to become vulnerable uh, to these Yankee cavalry uh, if you start moving around? Yeah. But nobody really talks about that because, and I, I see this, and I'm very patient. My wife tells me that I'm, and my mother told me I should be a diplomat, should have been a diplomat. <laughs> so I don't, you know, cross swords with anyone. But I'll gently explain the rest of the story because every, oh, it had to be this way. You yeah, know? Wait yeah. a minute, wait a minute. Maybe there's some other reasons for this. <laughs> so anyway. Um, but getting back to the story then, um, you know, so Lee is going to be um, uh, heading north, heading toward Frederick. And if you look at a map, it's really interesting. It's like Gettysburg. In fact, I think, I don't know if you've seen my book, um, it's called Lee Invades the North. I didn't bring a copy. Of I it. have it. I have it. Oh, do you have yes, it? Sir. Okay. And it's interesting because there's so many similarities between the two campaigns. And one was how fast Lee is going to be moving north and how far ahead he is of the of the Union troops. And so he's in Frederick up here. And, and McClellan is still, and again, oh, well, McClellan is slow. No, he's reorganizing his, his army, right. number one. And number two, do you want to ma- take your army this way when Lee might be going this way? Mm. You need to really understand what Lee's motive. You know, you need more information, more right. intelligence. And so, you know, here you have Frederick up here, Washington and uh, McClellan's army down here, a clear shot. I mean, boom, right up into Pennsylvania. He doesn't talk a lot about Pennsylvania, 
But we do know that Pennsylvania was his goal. Mm -hmm. Uh, It wasn't Maryland. He talked about going into Maryland, and he was, and he he didn't talk a lot about um, why he's invading. He talks about the supplies. He talks about issuing a proclamation. When I get into Maryland, I'm going to issue a proclamation to the citizens of Maryland. Come join the Confederacy. I'm here. I'm going to protect you. Um, He doesn't talk about the midterm elections that are coming up that could be influenced. He doesn't talk about how England and France are this close to recognizing the South. Um, He doesn't really talk about, to some degree, you know, Lee, uh, Lincoln has called up 300,000 guys, um, and they're coming into the Army. You know, not only the Army of the Potomac, but other armies, and he doesn't get into too much. If uh, the longer I wait, the stronger that army is going to be. It's going to be more of a handful. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's not as as strong as he is with supplies and invading Maryland. But um, it was just an audacious move to to move so quickly. And I think part of it also is he knew that the only way he was going to destroy that Union Army, he wasn't able to do it on the defensive at Second Manassas, is I'm going to move into into Maryland and Pennsylvania. I'm going to force the wounded Union Army to come out after me. And it hasn't been totally reorganized, and I'm going to destroy it at that point, even though it's going to be much, it's a much bigger army than what he had. 